Okay, we're gonna start now. <laughs> All right, uh, we're here now uh, with uh, Earl Caldwell, well, the renowned Earl Caldwell, and the uh, renowned uh, Jack White, uh, former uh, sorry, Time Magazine columnist, and the doubly renowned Lee Levine, who is the uh, uh, First Amendment lawyer uh, who has been doing this for uh, years and years, and uh, is also writing a book about uh, Earl Caldwell here. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, ask uh, uh, Mr. Caldwell if he has anything he wants to open this up with. Well, I would just like to start uh, by bringing up this document, a picture of this document. It's over 50 years old. Can you see it? Yes. And, and this is a historic document. And note the great list of names there. About there must be about 70 or 80 names at the bottom. It's so it's a who's who of really of black New Yorkers. Uh, this is uh, was from May of 1968. And at the top, in the bold letters, a message to the black community from black journalists. And we are asserting in this. Uh, this was a full page ad. It was a full page ad. The New York Association of Black Journalists uh, started in that, uh, that period. And uh, we, uh, and this is a, this was about a month or two months after I was subpoenaed to appear before a federal grand jury. And this, is really the start of a long series of events that is reason what, what brings us to uh, here this morning in a sense that uh, going full circle. Now, I know I took the long way of getting there, but let me say that it's great to see all of you. And uh, I, last night, I'm a big baseball fan. I, I, I describe myself as a Jackie Robinson baby because in so many ways, Jackie Robinson was the yes you can figure in my life. And I say that is uh, in the early days of uh, a life. And I tell people that right now, I said, you begin to scare me. I said, what? And I said, because when I, people ask me when I was born, the first year, the first year is, in a very short while, the first years ago, the first figure is going to be a nine. And people say, when you get that nine, you better get right with it because you know you had a long journey. And, and, and speaking of that, and yesterday, a, a great baseball player, great, wasn't on my team, but just a great baseball player, Brooke Robinson died. Great Baltimore Oriole, Hall of Famer. And I read an article last night, and he was talking about himself and answering the question of how is it? Why were you such a great player? What, how do you explain it? And he said that it had to do with his love for baseball. It, no, not his love for baseball, his passion for baseball. And he said his passion was so great, it it bordered on her. It was at the point of obsession. And I say that because when you look at that list of names of all those journalists that were signing on to this 1968 uh, document, 70. that describes, if you would say, well, what, what, what how, how were you as a group then? How did you feel about what you were doing? And, it was the same as Brooke Robinson. We were so passionate. It bordered on obsession. I think that's what really described us at that time. And that un gives understanding to why we went out. We were actually going to take full page ads and big papers. The New York Times was going to be the first one. When we found out what, we, the, the, what the New York Times was charging. <laughs> right. We, we went to Harlem and saw the Amsterdam News. <laughs> we still got what we needed. And, yeah. uh, and I think to this day, 
the late Jerome Crazer, who took the lead in this, paid, he said he paid for it. He said, but he never got paid back. And for me, so we got sick of it. He was always asking for his money. But uh, uh, Gerald and Spirit is with us this morning. Uh, I, I would say, and uh, you, I know you say 15 minutes. I, I, I could talk for 15 hours. Yes, we know, we know. <laughs> uh, in so many ways, the 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 biggest thing to have, well, no, no. This has been a very large thing, understandably, in my life. When I look back on it, people say, well, how do you feel about it? I mean, you must really be angry. And I, and I say, no, I, I actually feel that if this was going to happen, I didn't want to see it happen at all, but if it was going to happen in a way, for me, it was a blessing for me because so much, to the time, you know, we say, well, I'm not going to do this, or I believe that, but you're not really tested. But this was an opportunity for me at an early age of my life. I considered it an early age. Uh, to say things and then see if you can stand up to those things you say you believe in. And uh, I was... Uh, I, I said, I'm a, I'm a country boy, very small town in the mountains of Western Pennsylvania. It's in that section of Western Pennsylvania that has almost no black people. I used to refer to our town as an all white town. And had a few black people that were up there used to get on me, say, well, we don't count. You, you don't, we're nobody. Good. I, 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 what it is, is that in a small town like that, in a, in a certain kind of way, they, the larger community makes you, your family, honorary whites, as I think they used to, they call them, uh, Jack could correct me, if I, in, in, in South Africa, you get, you get standing as being an honorary white. And that was sort of the way it was. And I say, say that, in a way, I think that helped me with my newspaper career as I moved along because everything in that career was white. The newsroom was white. The stories that we covered were white. Uh, there was no, almost no black in it. Maybe occasional athlete or something. But on my level, uh, when I started, I started my career in a small town. And it was unique too because uh, they had a they had a uh, program, the newspaper called the Progress. It the name the town of course is Clearfield, Clearfield, Pennsylvania, and uh, the newspaper had a program that was for high school kids involved with the school paper. And if you excelled in a school paper. Uh, uh, you could apply for a full-time permanent job at the newspaper. And they had a training program would bring you in and get you started in career. And I thought it was a wonderful program uh, uh, because I could name a, a handful of, of journalists, all of them were white, uh, but they went on to be very, very good journalists. Right? And I thought it was a great idea. I didn't go into that program. I wasn't on the school newspaper, but I had a kid that was in room on the fringe of my neighborhood. Uh, I met him in the 10th grade. He's a Catholic and he came down from the little local Catholic school to the high school, Frank Carden. And he had been a, in the high school paper and he excelled in the, uh, I had, uh, out of high school, I had one year at the University of Buffalo in Buffalo, New York. And at the end of that school, and I was a business student. I had no business being a business student. Uh, but I had a professor, Roy Regal. He thought I was doing really well. I, my major was insurance. He said, well, how did you get this? One day, a high school teacher whom I admired said, if I was a young person starting out right now. He said, I'd get into the insurance business. I think, I, I, I thought he meant 
insurance business to me meant selling policies. When I took this thing to Buffalo, they meant studying the insurance. How do you do the insurance? And so uh, at the end of my first year, this professor said, I'm going to, I have a summer job. I think you should uh, uh, accept this. And it would be great for you and your career. You have a lot of promise. He said, it's in Philadelphia. Oh, I'm going to anybody that will listen to me in my little town. Say, well, I'll be leaving for Philadelphia. Next. I'm going to Philadelphia. Because in our town, anybody in any city, any big place, they were going to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was only 100 miles away. But Philly was this place way. And Philadelphians had disdain for people out in our part of the state. But I got to Philly, and and uh, I'm thinking I'm going to be working there. Everybody's so proud of me. And uh, I get there, and the guy says to me, well, you're Black. Nobody's going to hire you here. He said, but we, uh, he's telling me, the professor said, well, I have a lot of promise. And he said, so we're going to send you to an insurance company. Uh, and it was in Alabama. I don't recall the name of this in, in company right as we speak this morning. But many years, I never got into the insurance business. I never even spoke about it after that day. But many years later, after I was well down the road on my uh, career in journalism, covering the presidential campaign of the Reverend Jesse Jackson. We went to, I just can't call the name of it. Jack may remember it. We went to this insurance company in Alabama and met. And I met a lot of the people there and everything. And I sort of kept a, spent some time. It was a very successful operation. That's where they wanted to send me to that insurance company. And of course, I didn't go. And when I went back home, my high school buddy, who had taken the job at the newspaper, he was asking me, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And, and it's a pretty interesting thing. When I, when, when I came back from Philadelphia, it was on by bus. I didn't have the bus, didn't stop. The bus will take you to the center of the town and put you out. And instead of me going home, uh, about a mile away, uh, I said, I'm going down to the newspaper office and see if Frank is down there. I don't remember what time of day it was, but I went down there and he was there. We had a great reunion. And he says to me, you know, there's a job opening. I, I told him about, I was never going back to Buffalo. I was never going back to that school. They sent me to Alabama. And I was, and I, I took that to mean, and the guy in Philly says, you're black that nobody was going to hire me. <laughs> and so he said, there's a job opening in that. It was reading proof and being an assistant on the sports desk. And he was getting to me because this guy had was the, uh, I believe he might have been the sports editor by that point. I'm not sure, but he was in that. And uh, long and short is, I got the job at the newspaper. And from day one, from, it's just, it was, it was just like you, you, you spend so much time trying to understand what it is that you're going to do and searching for your place. And I remember my father telling me, giving me the talk. My bird, the talk that he gave me is, he says, you know, you're about to finish high school in another year. And he says, you know, you can't just lay around here after high school. He says, you have to learn to do something. You have to get a job. You have to work. He said, in this town, there's a lot of work up in these mountains. He said, but a lot of the jobs are not fit for a man. But you will wind up at one of these plants. And he made me go as a, in the next, uh, after he gave me the talk, in my junior year of high school, he sent me to one of those plants to work. And uh, I went there, it's called the sewer pipe plant. In my region of Pennsylvania, where there was coal was predominant. There was coal, deep coal. There was surface coal. As a matter of fact, my mother said, 
that when we came up from, and, and when I got over, I was asking, well, how did we get up here? I thought, I didn't want to say, well, we were running from something, but we were pretty far back in the mountains. But uh, uh, my mother said that we were going to this up to this place where there was all this work. And uh, uh, she said that when they got to this little town, she said, that's where I put my foot down. I told my, I told your father, I'm not going any further back into these mountains than this. And she said she thought it'd be too isolated for the children. We were a family of 10, of which six survived. If you look at the at it now, when they my parents came up to Pennsylvania from the south, they lost the first, they had lost the first two in our family. And when they came to Pennsylvania, they lost the first two more up there. But this was the big pandemic of the 100 years ago. They came up there in the early 1920s. And uh, so that's where, sort of where I start my life. And uh, by the way, I, one of the things I carry from what, what I said was about the surface coal. My father, my mom said, oh, your father had a great place picked out. We were going to go, but she said it was too isolated. But she said it just had everything. And one of the things she meant, she said, even a place where you go and dig your own coal right on our own property. And I'm, and as I, the older I got, the more I'm thinking, geez, we could have been like a lot of those white people up there. When the surface That's a good place. That's a good place. They place. Sliced <laughs> the mountains open. <laughs> That's a good place for me to interrupt, Earl. <laughs> in the, uh, uh, the only one, three seconds. Only, uh, 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 I lost my place. But at any rate, uh, we'd have been like the other people up there. They bought, uh, had that surface coal. A lot of them bought helicopters and crashed and everything because they had got all that coal money. Anyhow. Anyhow, I, we're going to go to our first question from Jack. I followed the newspaper business. And, Earl, Earl, let's let's have Jack ask the question. Okay, Earl, okay, Earl. Let, I wanna I wanna leap forward a few years from that. It was a, a period of time in the late late sixties and early seventies when you were almost like a black journalistic zealot. You were in the middle of every big story. You were <laughs> present when present when uh, when Dr. King was killed. You 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 covered the trials of Angela Davis and 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 Patty Hearst, and you were also, but, mo but most memorably for us and for our discussion today, you were at the center of the, the, uh, the federal government's attempt, the Nixon administration's attempt at that time to co-opt you into becoming part of their uh, crackdown on the Black Panther Party. And your case, uh, it became a lightning rod for black journalists around the country. The, the, the document you showed at the beginning uh, from the New York Association of Black Journalists and then later on and the part I want you to talk about right now uh, was when black journalists from around the country, there were only a handful of us at the time, gathered in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri uh, to show our support for you. And we created an organization that later became one of the forerunners of the National Association of Black Journalists. In fact, I think we can argue that your case was, was really sort of the, the starting point uh, for the organization of Black journalists that we've seen now and the sort of, of uh, joint identity that Black journalists uh, have, have, have formed over that period of time. Can you talk about a little about, about that and what it felt like to becoming, removing from being a journalist covering big stories to becoming actually the center of a big story yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, it, uh, let me just say by, uh, that when I started my career, I was a sports writer up in the mountains, and it went very well. And uh, Frank, the guy who got, uh, back then, you would get, they would train you, but they wanted you to leave once you got training and really knew what to do because they weren't going to pay you they were used to pay us in cash. And, they, and I said, they pay us in cash because so little, they don't want anybody to know how little we get. And, but I started off with sports and uh, I went then to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And 
my career did very well there. And I, I applied for a job in the state capital sports writer, and I didn't get that. When I went up, I was interviewed and they hired me. I came back and gave notice, but I never heard from those people again. And uh, the editor of the paper said, we really like you. We uh, want you, we'll take, let you take your uh, resignation back. And uh, I didn't want to go back to sports. I thought, I'm going to be here the rest of my life. And so I wanted to get news. And I got news training and became a news reporter there. And uh, very soon, after, I was in just a very short period of time. And one of the things about the news business, reporters would go to get other jobs. There was a lot of movement. And when you got another job, if you could see, call back to your old friends at that paper. I know it's a lot of paper, people in, in Lancaster went to Wilmington, Delaware, called back, maybe about three or four people went there. They didn't call me. Then I had the group that went to Rochester, New York, and they got up there and they called me. Uh, and uh, I went up there. They said, it's great. I'll call all your love. And I went up there, got an interview with a guy named Al Newhart, who be, then became a very prominent uh, uh, leader in journalism. And uh, he hired me. But when I went to Rochester, they asked me, would you, as a Black reporter, not, they didn't say it's a Black reporter, it's you as a Black person, it's you as a Negro, would you object to writing about the Negro community. No, I said, no, I jumped at it because I didn't know. I didn't, hadn't been around a big major black community. So it was, and I accepted it. And then of course that launched me on a whole new phase of my career. Uh, and the issues and things that I wrote about in Rochester, they would be the same things that I would work. And I left Rochester to get a, a, to go to New York City. And uh, uh, I was on the race story, you might say, really for the rest of my career. And, but it, it, you could almost feel every year there was certain, the, It was like a, you're writing about yourself and your own community and you're, you're asking people to tell you stuff, to use their name and put their name in the newspaper. And that, so it was a whole different experience for me. And that would lead me, uh, uh, after I came to New York, uh, the, unfortunately, the Herald Tribune, my first paper folded. I wound up at the New York Post. New York Times told me to come over there, and I did. And uh, this would be in uh, March of 1968. And that would, that, that summer would be the greatest, there was a, the, no other summer like it in America for uh, racial uprisings. And that was the start of a whole different twist to what we were doing and who we were. And uh, by then it was 19, 1968, as I said. And, and meeting people that had whole different ideas of what it meant to be a Black American. I re remember the Alambe Brath and his brother, two young guys about my age then, had a little studio at, at, on 125th Street. And they had what they called the A-Jazz dancers, the A-Jazz performers. And these were black women who had almost no hair. And uh, and they were promoting pictures of black. Uh, uh, one of the uh, Brath brothers was a photographer and he would be taking these pictures of the blackest black people he could find. And, he, and they was the first time the beginning of this gravitating to black. And it was a, uh, in, every, in every way, it was such a fascinating time. Covering How did that lead black, to this meeting that, uh, that Jack was referencing? Covering black America was always, every day was just a chock full of who knows what's coming today. Uh, Jack, I, I, I don't know if I missed your question, <laughs> I wanted you to talk about the, about the Jefferson City. 
and what happened there and how important that was in creating this sort of a unification of, of black journalists. When this whole thing with the government started, I didn't take it seriously. I believed in what we used to call in the newsroom, the power of the press. And uh, whenever they, as a matter of fact, an FBI agent told me they were going to do this if I didn't cooperate with the, with what they wanted. And uh, I, I was talking, talking to them like, they know, you have no idea. I'm telling them, you have no idea what's going to come down on you if you do that. And I, I did not realize that in the scheme of things, there was no power of the press. We had the power maybe to uh, destroy some people's careers by saying certain things or snapping at them, but in, when it came to our defending our position about what we considered our rights, we really didn't have the power to make those things real. And, uh, uh, but I didn't understand that. So when I never took, I really didn't check it seriously at the beginning. But uh, uh, when we went to Jefferson City, I did because uh, the government began to move right away about making this real. And I'll remember the first time I appeared before a judge and, and uh, they made it clear that if you don't cooperate, you will go to jail. And, I couldn't believe that they would actually put me in jail. I just couldn't believe it. And, and then once you realize that, it changes everything. But Jefferson City was the a, a huge turning point because I didn't even know we had all of the black journalists. And we all slipped off from our jobs and went out to this college in uh, Missouri uh, for what was a just a very emotional weekend, but just to know that all of us existed and that everybody there was had ideas and we discussed how can we defend Earl Caldwell? How can we do this? What do we do? And uh, so it was a it was a giant turning point. But prior to Jefferson City, when I actually had to go before the federal uh, authorities for the first time, uh, the, the one of the stunning things that I was found, and I didn't find it, other people found it uh, uh, at the New York Times. Said, well, you know, the problem here is is that the government's action and the government's petition, it only speaks of Earl Caldwell. He has this information. Blah, blah, blah. It was, they didn't, the New York Times was not in it in any way. It was just me. Oh, you're out there sort of by yourself. Earl, hold up, hold up for a second. When they first, when you first got the notice that the government was coming after you, what was the attitude of the New York Times management, the editors there? What, what, what did they think you should do? What did they advise you to do? Well, they didn't advise me to, they, they, they told me, and one of the things I would say about the New York Times is that they never told me what to do. Uh, they said it would be my decision, but they got had a Jim Goodale, and introduced me to the New York Times lawyers, and they had lawyers who didn't feel, didn't have the same position as these people, these reporters who were on this thing. The Black, those of us who were Black. Uh, but in this period, I mentioned Lombre Breath also, there was a big change in who we were. The Black people, the colored people, that through that, Thing all away and became black. And it was just that. And in the black journalists, one of the things that black journalists began to do was organize. We actually began to organize before I was subpoenaed. We in New York, we called it black perspective. 
The reason being, Thomas A. Johnson was a, like a, one of the senior most of the black journalists there. And he said, if it's called black, I can't be in it. He said, the New York Times wouldn't allow it. He said, it, you could have an organization of all the black people, but you couldn't call it black. And they wouldn't, they, was, they were reluctant to even use black in describing uh, people of color. Who was the uh, editor of that, uh, Earl? Abe Rosenthal. Okay. And Abe Rosenthal he loved Tom Johnson. He hired Tom. He hired me too. He hired me without an interview. I was working at the New York Post. Uh, I came to the paper and asked me when New York Times said, and they told me said, uh, uh, you won't be writing anything for number of weeks. This is a New York Times, you have to go through orientation. So we don't we do things, we have our own system, your own style, they had their own style book. And uh then on the day that my first day there, I had my brand new books brother suit. Uh an editor says to me, uh well, and I was supposed to be sitting at the front with editors and see how they make up the paper and all that kind of stuff. And one of the editors said, anybody talk to you? I'm saying, about what? He said, well, no, 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 no. I just wonder if anyone's mentioned anything. And then you see the guys looking at me. And finally, Arthur Gell comes over to me. He was number two behind A and says, we'd like you to go out on a story. Would you mind doing it? He said, I know you're supposed to be on orientation, but I said, no, what's the story? They were uh, James, uh, James uh, Meredith. 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 Uh, 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 pulling out of the race against Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And I went up to Harlem, did the story, came back, and I remember Manny Perlmutter came over to my desk, who's a veteran reporter. He said, I just can't believe that you're writing a story on your first day. He said, uh, that's just not like the New York Times. He said, you have to go through orientation. You got to understand this is the New York Times and how you do. I started writing on the first day. Never had, we never went back to orientation. Uh, I'm still not sure about understanding that. Uh, the next day, someone from the New York Post called me and said, hey, if you were just going over there to write reaction stories, you could have stayed here and done that. <laughs> uh, but they had a good point. Why was it so important for me to go to Harlem to write a reaction story? I said to Manny Perlmutter, I said, you know, this is nothing. I could have written this story without leaving the office. Ooh. He clattered up and started to rain on me. He said, this is the New York Times. You make up something in this paper. And you blah, 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 blah. I told him, I, no, I didn't mean I'd make up anything. I was just trying to say that why was I pulled off of my orientation to do what I considered a very small little story. But that was the deal. And I never went back. I never had any orientation. I never had even that interview of uh, what we're going to do, what's this and that and other thing, you know. Okay, but Earl, Earl, when your case came up, though, didn't you have the feeling, I think you've told me this before, that the New York Times was trying to encourage you to cooperate with the FBI at this point? And wasn't that sort of the message you were getting from them? That was definitely the message. And that, uh, in, in that, it might have even turned out that way, but it was uh, we we had organized this group called Black Perspective, and that we, so we didn't get into that black journalist thing. So Tom could come in and everything, and uh, but Tom and Gerald and I at the New York Times. I mean, we were like uh, you know the the passion, the obsession. After work every night, the three of us would go get, sometimes we'd take the New York Times car. We would be going out. Our job didn't end because we were leaving the paper. It was, you keep going. And so when something happened to me, it was happening to all of us. We were making the decision that became, quickly became this thing involved. Uh, and it swept across the Black community. And I think even that, 
I think even the New York Times was surprised at the black response. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wonder if now, Lee, do you uh, want to jump in here and ask you a question about? I I, I want to say one other thing if oh, I could. Okay. <laughs> Black people are criticized so often for not doing this, not having that, not preparing for things. And uh, what happened that so we were looking for uh, uh, a lawyer for me, just reporters. By then I had been sent out to California to do some stuff and uh, I'm out there and uh, we don't have a lawyer. And they, there's a specific date. You got to appear before the court. We didn't have a lawyer. And I remember the night before I'm supposed to appear before the court at, and in the morning, we didn't have a lawyer. And we're talking about the lawyers we know. We knew criminal lawyers. And, and then we got a call from New York. The call came from Jack Greenberg, who was at Columbia then. He was the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And they said, we know you need a lawyer. And they understood a constitutional lawyer. And they said, we have a lawyer. And he's in California. He's in Northern California, where I was. And they told me I should go to see him. And I told, took this information to the group. I think about four or five Black journalists from out there. And the first thing, I got this lawyer. It's going to work. Is he Black? I said, I actually I haven't met him. I don't I don't know anything about him. I, they say he's down in uh, Los Altos, which is near uh, Stanford University. And we went down there, and then that's where I think I got the greatest break of my life when I met Anthony Amsterdam, Tony Amsterdam, who was a constitutional lawyer. And he was with the Legal Defense Fund. He was also a professor at Stanford University. And I'll always remember. When we went to his house, first place we were in going out. We were in cafes, going to talking about getting a lawyer. When we got to Amsterdam's house, it was it was close to midnight. And we had to call him to see if he would even stay. And he said, No, 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 we're waiting for you. He says, I know you're coming, we're waiting. And uh, we got to his house. I had said, I'm not doing it. They can't make me do it. But those were just statements from the, I want to say the stupid, because you don't really know. We got to Amsterdam's house. He was waiting for us. We weren't in his house. We weren't in his house three or four minutes. And he said he'd been talking to people in New York. And he said, we've been, I've been uh, uh, looking into this. And he said, I, I'm convinced you have a legal right to refuse. I'm saying, I'm not going to do it. You can't make me do it. I'm not going to go to jail, they're saying. He said, you have a legal right to refuse. And that was like manna from heaven that just changed everything. It changed everything forever. And uh, he was absolutely right. And uh, he made the, the New York Times vice president, Harding Bancroft, flew to California to support Caldwell. And on the morning following that night when I met Amsterdam, uh, I was to go before the federal grand jury. And Amsterdam says to me, when after he told me, he says, no, 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 I don't want you to go. You don't go. I said, what, what do you mean I don't go? He said, I'm going for you. You stay home. He said, no, I want you to come to this, this office. The Times had a hired a lawyer in, in San Francisco. He said, but you come two or three hours late and don't come in. Don't say anything. You just stay in the waiting room. I'll come get you. I'm in the little waiting room then in the Pillsbury Madison Sutra office. Harding Bancroft comes out. He has to go to the bathroom and he sees, he says, oh, this lawyer, it's Amsterdam. Where did you find him? He said, this is the best thing to happen to us so far. He said, it's he's just great. And he goes on. In time, they would come to hate him. But Amsterdam was a brilliant constitutional lawyer. 
And he, uh, in the Legal Defense Fund, would take on from that point the all of the expense of uh, uh, the litigation. And um, Tony Amsterdam would, would uh, map out a uh, strategy it went in, in, you know, in the district court, the New York Times called our this, the decision of the court in the, in the district court a great victory and said it's over. And then Amsterdam said, no. Caldwell would still have to go before the grand jury. And he said, he doesn't want me to go before the grand jury. He's right when he's uh, the argument that I was making, I go before the grand jury. It's a secret proceeding. They put prosecutors to come out and say anything. He said, and uh, he's going to fight for me not to go at all. And that broke everything between me and the New York Times. There was a famous memorandum. I don't have it with me. in the Abe Rosenthal posted on the bulletin board in New York. All the reporters were in an uproar, I'm told. And basically what he said in there was, and he used this language, we all feel sorry for Earl Caldwell and the difficult position he finds himself in. New York Times, not in it. It's not their reporting. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's when we went our own way, but Tony Amsterdam crafted out a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant approach to all of this. We won a great victory in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And uh, I believe we would have uh, prevailed at the Supreme Court level, but uh, uh, the newest member of the court was William Rehnquist. And he had been in the Justice Department speaking about me. Fred Graham said, you wouldn't believe what this lawyer was. Fred Graham covered the justice for the New York Times. He called me in California. I couldn't believe what this lawyer in the Justice Department is saying about you, man. And this was Rehnquist. I'm trying to find those documents now. But uh, Rehnquist cast the deciding vote in this. And it, but by that time, uh, the Supreme Court ruled the Black Panthers were decimated. Uh, they had, there was, not, there was not much left. And so, uh, it was really moot insofar as I'm concerned, but I felt and still feel today that we won that case. They, to prevail, they had to steal it, which I, I believe they, uh, you know, if Rehnquist would have stepped aside, recused himself, then it would have been a tie and then we would have prevailed. So, but that was another story. Okay. All right, Lee. Oh, so many questions. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I guess I'll, I'll limit myself to this one. Um, Earl, um, the after, of course, some years after uh, your ordeal, uh, the extent to which the FBI was engaged in a covert counterintelligence campaign to destroy the, the Panthers uh, became known, as well as the extent to which part of that campaign was attempting to manipulate press coverage of the Panthers. Um, talk about the extent to which at the time uh, you were aware or not aware of uh, what the FBI was up to or the extent to which you suspected what the FBI was up to? Uh, you know, the FBI never dealt with me. And I don't think, I don't think the FBI ever dealt really with Black journalists in any, in the way they did, you know, you have, for example, when I came to New York City, there was no commanders of any of the precincts who was black. They appointed one in Harlem. And uh, I remember when this guy got the job, he would have, he would invite Tom and Gerald and I to come and have dinner. Let's go dinner and talk. And uh, he would introduce, sometimes he'd bring a high ranking officer with them and he, they, he would introduce us to him. Uh, and, and so we had a relationship. And in those relationships, you, 
you see things you can mention to them uh, or they see things they can ask of you. There is a way that you can both, you can hold on to your position, your rights, your, your, what, your conduct, but you, there is a communication. There was no communication with the FBI. They didn't tell me nothing ever. And, uh, is this, there was a, there were, it, we had organized a Black Journalists Association in California. When I, I was sent out to California after the King assassination to find out, well, what are these, what are the Black people going to do? And the Panthers had already picked up the gun, so they, they took that. And, uh, I, and that's when I began to see things and, and, and became aware of it. At the experiences of other journalists were having with the FBI or things happening involving the Panthers. But with the Panthers, it was the killing of uh, Fred Hampton in Chicago. And that would be a big turning point. They came in the night, guns, and by even they were the, the, the police officials in Chicago, they all conceded that there was. Uh, there was a lot of things that were done that were not right, including the killing of him. And uh, I and we took that to Maine as reporters. The FBI, the, the they're coming for the Black Panthers' main office, Chicago. It was the Chicago bureau uh, office, and we, it was a certainty that they were coming for uh, the head office in uh, Oakland, Berkeley. And indeed, yeah, back then when the, the old type reporters learned how to read upside down and a reporter in Oakland was reading upside down on a, a desk that he, in, in, uh, a, 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 a law enforcement official, and it was a plan to in, 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 invade the Black Panther headquarters. The reporter wanted to write the story. The Oakland Tribune wouldn't let him do it. Uh, they didn't publish the story. But he be told this to others, uh, and including, he told Black reporters. I went to, there was a, the head of the uh, Black journalist thing in, in, in Oakland was a guy named Rush Greenlee. And he was working for the, uh, public television station. And in San Francisco, they had created a unique kind of uh, broadcast. They would bring the reporters in around a round table and they would discuss stuff and could ask questions back and forth. I went to, we were gonna meet, have a little meeting after their broadcast and I'm in a cafe right across the street from them sitting watching the show, having a beer. And suddenly, Two of these guys, Rush and Walt, a guy named Walt Thompson, I think it was, I'm they, they go grab the microphone from the guy who was the host. Said, we got to commandeer the microphone. There's stories going on and things are happening against, against the black community. And uh, so we've got to make you aware they won't print the story. And they were talking about this raid on the Black Panthers. And uh, that was like unheard of. You don't just took over the broadcast. We we had a black journalist meeting, the only black journalist meeting ever at my house in my apartment. And uh, we had a guy work for the black paper, Rufus Byars. Oh boy! And he showed up at a meeting. About the Amsterdam News. The, he worked for the Black Paper in San Francisco. Oh, in San Francisco, okay. Yeah, and, and, and he showed up at the meeting. He came, had this big bag. I'm thinking like, wow, here come Rufus, and he got a bag full of food. I guess he knew I wouldn't have anything. And Rufus comes in, but he doesn't take the food. Huh? He just comes in, and we're talking. I'm wondering, well, why is the food just sitting there? And we were talking about what had happened and the, what the FBI was doing and what the Black Panther and he grabs this bag and puts it on the table, turns it up. He got the bag full of pistols. 
I'm looking at this guy sticking like, what is going on? And he said, the time has come. The black journalists got to pick up the guns. They're, he said, they're coming for the Black Panthers. They're going to come for us. They're already come for Caldwell. And he said, we get to pick up that gun. And he starts passing his gun this, <laughs> out to all of the reporters. And I'm, to me, and I'm thinking, like, I'm not putting my fingerprints on one of them. And so I ain't get, I, I said, wait a minute, Rufus, wait a minute. Don't you tell me that I am afraid to pick up the gun. I said, my father gave me a rifle when I was 16. And I went up the mountains and, the, and, and he said, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. So uh, you are a righteous brother. I know you are not afraid to pick up the gun. He said, it's these other ones. <laughs> and now I'm laughing. But I say that to say there was a serious ideas about what our conduct ought to be and what we ought to be prepared to do to face the moment and the situation that we found ourselves. Wow. Okay. All right. Let me uh, 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 target the, our audience now uh, of uh, journalists and uh, uh, people who no doubt, and 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 those from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press as well, who no, who no doubt would like to hear what you have to say in terms of uh, advice for this current generation of journalists, given uh, what you've been through and given the case that uh, prompted the Reporters Committee, uh, what would you say to them now about some of the priorities they should be having? When I went to Hampton University and that with the Scripps Howard Foundation was had built a, 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 a wonderful uh, uh, building, uh, to house this new thing. It's the first uh, journalism school that uh, they were part of, uh, of the black colleges. And uh, I must say, when I went to Hampton, I started off with the same thing as I started off here today with this uh, document. And that would become uh, my way of introducing the students at the university. Uh, to what was actually happening and how it in, 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 how it would involve that they would be pulled into this, going into journalism, what they ought to know, what they ought to be prepared for, and uh, what was coming at them. And the kids, of course, were very, 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 very much on the side of the Black Panthers. It really, in the Black community, eventually, the Panthers had a lot of uh, support in the Black community because I don't think, I'm not saying it was the guns. I think it was a way that they they were not afraid to it, uh, go against uh, whatever authority it would be, mainly police authority. And uh, it resonated across Black America. And uh, uh the students had that same kind of attitude. They, they wanted to be, you know, hard hitting reporters. When, when I went to Hampton University 20 years ago, print journalism ruled. When I went in there, I, I, I always compare it with a Jack, you know, there's a old pictures about the African uh, uh, kings or whatever to carry them in. I was sort of, I felt like that. I came in, I was a big celebrity to university simply because, because of this whole thing that I had been through. And, uh, and then we couldn't see it right away, but the, the whole print journalism thing was coming apart. It would be not very long when I was there that uh, uh, the print journalism was dropped as a, you could, you could get a degree in print journalism. They, they, they dropped it. It was this whole, uh, this, un, this upheaval brought by the technology. You could not have prepared for it. And that is what swept over journalism at Hampton in just a very few years. But when I went there to start, 
we were doing an oral history led by the idea of uh, Dory Maynard, who was at the Maynard Institute then. And we began to get the stories of black journalists, what they had been through, what they, what, how, they, how they saw things, where, where we should go and all of this. And we began to record them. Uh, we recorded them in New York and we, our, our, our work in New York got interrupted because of the 9-11 attacks on New York City. And uh, then we went to California and recorded. And then when I went to Hampton, we came to Hampton and recorded. I think uh, I think one of the very first we recorded in uh, Hampton University was Jack E. White Jr., who's here today. And I always remember uh, that, that, that sitting with the dean that day, that uh, fellow whose name I can't recall, but he said to me, we got to get him down here. We got to get him on the faculty. And that did join the faculty shortly after that. Uh, yep. Earl, are you talking about Tony Brown? I'm sorry? Are you talking about Tony Brown? This, this is the fellow no, before. No, no, no. Uh, this was... Um... Uh, this was the, Tony Brown's predecessor. Um, later oh, went on to be head, head of the journalism school at uh, Southern Mississippi University. I can't, I can't recall his name. Oh, right okay. Now. All right. Yeah, he was. All right, anyway, second... uh, anyway, Earl, you're, you you were saying your message for the current generation of journalists. I I couldn't hear you. you said what? Your, your message for the current generation of journalists. I'm losing the sound. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can hear. You. No, I can't hear you. <laughs> when you sit back, um, Richard, that he can hear you, but when you lean All forward. Right. How about this? Yes. Okay. Oh. Uh, your message for the current generation of journalists. Uh, I, it happened in university. I said that I went in like a king and print journalism. Jack was there. We were getting all the papers, get the Washington Post and New York. They wouldn't even pick, the students wouldn't even pick the papers up. Right. Students saw something before the professors saw it. And that was the beginning of the end of print journalism. I mean, it just it didn't exist. The students saw another way to tell stories. On the last class I had at Hampton University, in the last my last semester there, I think I had twenty, maybe twenty four, maybe about twenty one, twenty three some students. I think I gave nine of them an A plus. I think I gave about eight of them an A, and I the rest of them I gave A minus. It's the best class I had. I was asking the students, had been challenging the students for some time, is this new media that was coming within the within the journalism school itself? When I went there, the largest component in the journalism school was broadcast journalism, and then it was public relations, and then I think it was print. Uh, public relations survived, and it was always uh, a very popular part of the uh, of the uh, school. And, Hampton University is overwhelmingly women. Probably, I think it was like 90 some percent when I started there. Uh, the uh, Most of the people were learning how to be reporters. I, I'm sorry, when I first went there, they had, and this was a staff that uh, was already in place. They had, before Scripps Howard got involved, they had some kind of a journalism uh, entity, but it changed dramatically once the new building and all of that. But it was primarily, the, the focus was on reporting. 
this is sending the students out to actual city council meeting in in the uh, 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 from the daily press, the local newspaper. They covered things. They and the emphasis was on reporting. When when the change came, the one of the things that got lost was the reporting. It wasn't we teaching reporting. It was more preparing people for television jobs. And those jobs were really like anchors jobs. Uh, 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 but the student, but what happened was this new technology, the students were excellent at understanding and how you use these new platforms. And so they began to develop a whole different way of, uh, I, I would say, storytelling. In, in that last semester, when I gave uh, all of the high grades, I mean, I would like to, we don't have the time for me to get into it, but I'd like to, the students took projects. You know, in Hampton, you have to either have a final exam or a final project. And these final projects that they took on, pandemic was going on by then too, but they were brilliant. They knew how to take the pictures. And I said, well, wait a minute. The cameras, the university's cameras are here. I can see them. They're all lined up. Students are in here. They said, we used our phone. How did you edit those films? You not edit film? Girl says to me, anybody knows anything about the Scripps Higher School of Journalism knows that you cannot pass if you don't not proficient in Final Cut Pro editing program. Okay. So you were taking pictures, you're editing the film. They could do the whole thing. One person could actually do, and on this new media, you could put that out there. I, one of my students, his, I, I think it was his grandfather or his great grandfather, excuse me for my, but he was in the Marines and he was the first black to hold a high position in the Marines. This kid had this grandfather out in the backyard recording him with the phone, telling his story about, and I later saw it on a, Another channel on a major channel, major channel in Virginia. It was amazing. He's asking him these questions. He's edited the film and he brings back to me and my class a total finished product. We had a young woman who was a, a, a very, uh, she's a woman who was um, the star little league baseball pitcher, uh, a black woman, and uh, she was now a student and an athlete playing this with the softball team at Hampton. She took, she says, you know, we go out on these, to play these games, we go out for like two weeks and we play this team for three games and we play two over here. We play, And so they're out. And she talked about how that time that you have. And she took and laid out the places where they would be and then investigated what civil rights, how did civil rights movement impact these, these, these towns? And what is around these towns that you could specifically go and see and, and understand? And she, she did a one hour television, uh, 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 and I don't wanna say television, she did a one hour presentation on film. It was just stunning. The way that she found out these, the way that she was able to bring all these pieces together, but do everything herself. She did the research. She took the pictures. She did the editing. I, I mean, so this student, is why I, so I think the students this, is, have a, this, is, this is the direction you think that uh, we should be going, that the current generation should be. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm not saying that. I would ask the students constantly, is this the golden era for black people that had no ownership in media? Uh, uh, that, but suddenly you can have, you have, a, you have a platform where you can take to there any story that you have to tell. And these kids have skills they know 
how to tell these stories from A to Z, which I think is revolutionary to be able to do this. Before, just the cost of these things would be prohibitive. Yeah. But now they can do it. So what We're, is the message to this generation? I can't hear you. Back up. What, what is the message? Back up, Richard. He can't hear right. you. When you're... How about this? Yes. Uh, OK. What is your message then to these this current generation, that this is the kind of thing they should emulate? My, 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 the, the thing that I see is this it is within the grasp of this generation to maybe give us the kind of media that we've never had in this country fair inclusive and daring because they don't see any sacred cows you know we're going to do anything for example i mentioned these two and another one one young woman she told me uh, for her final project, she wanted to take a dozen students and, and, and wanted to zero in on their lives about what the pandemic did to them. How would it, well, about halfway through the time, she come to me and said, I want to change. I said, what do you mean? She said, I don't want to do that. I'm saying, you're halfway through the class. How are you not going to do it? The reason is there was so much pain that these and all the things that these students were going through just didn't want to deal with it. I said, so what are you going to do for your final project? She said, I'm going to do something on roller skating. I said, uh, uh, you're not serious. So what do you mean? This, this is your final grade you're talking about. She said, no, I want to do something on roller skating. I said, tell me a story about what you want to do. She said, well, we got these here big size plus women and they're doing this thing. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. back up. What are you talking about? Big women. I let that go. And she said, then you got the white roller skating and the black roller skating. You got the big people in the thick. And she had all this thing about her. I said, I don't see any story here that you're telling that would fit into the situation we're doing. But I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will let you give me, uh, uh, and you could, and I, I said, I remember the amount of time. I gave her time to really bring her idea together and present it to me, and she did. And then after that, I, I was I was actually stunned, and I'm gonna skip forward here now to the final product. It was amazing how she took an idea about roller skating and made a big social political statement with it. Most places I didn't even realize roller skating is such a popular thing. And you've got all different kinds of people are into roller skating. But she was able to zero in on it, talk to these people, edit this film and bring it all together in a really uh, a professional way. I, I thought it was, but my point is the students know how to use all of these elements in this new media. And they can bring together things that I don't know where we're going, but let me put it like this. Judy Claims, who was the president of the Scripps Howard Foundation, she resigned. She came to make her last speech at the journalism school. And one of the things she said at the very end was, she said to the students, these times have changed. Everything is different now. And she told the students, don't you be afraid to go into entrepreneurial uh, ventures because the technology will allow you to do things that you couldn't even thought of before. How can you do that? I would say, let me go one step further. I'm sitting in there and I'm listening to all this and I'm thinking like, wow, this is me now. I'm thinking like, I could have my own BET network myself. I could, before, when I remember Bob Johnson got BET, I'm thinking like, I could do that. I 
there was a guy, I think he has Charter Communications, I forget his name, Malone. And they talk about all the money that was needed for to, to this B, yeah, to do the BET thing. Now yeah. you can you can go on this new media and all of these things are within reach. It within reach of your skills, in reach of your money, in reach of your this new world that the students are just in love with and that they're constantly engaged with and they can see it. And uh, they brought to the class. I thought that was one of the most stunning things for me to walk out the door with at Scripps Howard. All right. I think that's a good uh, point to end on. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. By the way, Chris Campbell is the guy we were thinking of. Who, Chris who, Campbell, who, right. Yeah, who preceded uh, Tony Brown. Right. Uh, th thank you all. This uh, well, no, I, can I make a closing statement? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What's your closing statement? <laughs> what's your closing statement? <laughs> I, I want to say this to Lee Levine. Uh, sometime, one Lee came down to Hampton. We talked. White. We talked White. For a while, and he asked me one day. <laughs> what about your FBI file? I said, I don't even want to know. I don't want to know what they were doing where I'm concerned because I said it would it would just be chilling for me. I, I got enough. Because of what I see the students are able to do, I'm saying, I think I'm going to get that file and see what see what's in it, see what they're doing. Uh, it, there's so much that we don't know. And we're in a very difficult, you know, how we are in America now. We're, it used to be, it was so simple being a reporter. You're trying to search for the truth. And as Giuliani says now, what truth? There's the, we got a whole lot of truth. Uh, everything is on the table. What are we building? What are we going to do? I can see that there is a way forward. And I think that these young people have a big leg up because they are uh, the children of this new media. And uh, now for myself as an old head, I, and I, I, I actually find myself some days now when I can get out of bed, be leaving. And I actually could, I have a little name, Earl Caldwell's Bison Bison Network. But it sounds uh, like some cold well nonsense, but it, it does make it possible. Once you see the technology, the skills that are within just the film editing, the day the student said to me, everybody knows anything about Scripps Howard. And I've been there longer than anyone knows that you can't graduate if you're not proficient in Final Cut Pro. I didn't know that, but that was in the TV thing. I'm not really into that. But what I'm, my point is, and you could say, well, that doesn't even sound like the university. That sounds like the trade school down the street. And in a way it is, there is a dovetail. Uh, there was never any way to teach journalism the best way to teach new people to come into journalism was to get them a job on a newspaper and have editors work with them and get them started. Students, we want you to come in being proficient in uh, grammar, uh, uh, the basic skills, and we'll show you the way. And I believe that this technology is going to be the portal that we go through to get to the new day, to the new dawn, or to the dawn in the new journalism. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, 15 minutes has a new meaning. <laughs> Good luck with the editing. Yes, indeed. Okay, uh, we're gonna, you know, to boil this down. Hey, one and, final uh, little statement. Uh, one sec, so just three seconds. All right, three seconds. 
you know, uh, you must excuse me because this Zoom is new to me. I was refused Zoom. Now I love Zoom. You know, it's this new thing just within our class. All right. Well, play. you were just talking about the new technology, so uh, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Even but, our generation but, appreciate but, it. How would you answer that question? What do you see for the new tech? Where do you see us going? Well, me or, or Lee? You, you and Jack. You and Jack and Lee. You know, I think can't it's do still anything about it. Huh? I said, it's here. We can't do anything about that. We just have to make sure that it goes in the direction that we want it to go. No, but what? Go ahead. The issue for me is how how you maintain the consistent values that make journalism important in the face of the new technology. How do you, in a, in a time when you can you can invent very plausible uh, through this AI or whatever, very plausible versions of a new reality? Uh, how do you how do you how do you keep maintain the credibility of journalism in the future? Uh, I think that's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, that's one challenge. The other challenge is when you're faced with a political situation uh, in which lying has become the uh, the default position of many politicians and, and these arguments about whose truth is it uh, is going to prevail, how do you how do you do it? How do we how does how does how does journalism retain its 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 credibility in the future? And I'm not sure that we're that we're anywhere near finding answers to that to that question. Uh, we, the journalism is just widely distrusted now for very good reasons. Um, what passes for journalism uh, is it, it, again is going through through changing definitions. When you when when you don't have to work for a newspaper or a magazine or a TV network in order to be considered journalist, we can start your own thing and who knows what your what your um standards are that you're maintaining uh it's it's i i, I, I i'm i'm very i'm not i'm not happy about it I'm, I'm 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 glad i'm not still in it because i think we're all at sea and i think it's i think there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh wobbling that has to be done before we're on firm footing again if we ever get to if we ever get on firm footing again but Jack, this new technology will open the door. Where before it the door, opens door it opens the door for, to for people of color, the door was closed completely. Yeah. And it's well, going to it open opens the, the door. It, it, opens it, it, the door. Not... it opens the door to it. It's it it, it it's a door. There's a whole lot of doors that it opens, and not and not all of them are good doors. Uh, it's again. I'm going back to this question of how do you maintain? How are people supposed to judge in the future which sources of so-called journalism can be trusted? Which ones are credible? Which ones are really sort of trying to maintain the old standards? And which ones are doing whatever the hell it is that they're doing? And how are people supposed to? You know, we, we teach critical thinking in 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 at least uh, at least we used to. We uh, where, where some people could. To differentiate and make and decide which sources to trust and which not to trust, but I think that's been constantly undermined. And the same technology that opens up opportunities for people to uh, produce credible journalism also opens up possibilities for them to produce journalism which is not credible, and which but which will be increasingly difficult for people to make to decide to differentiate between the two. So I'm not I'm 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 worried. Uh, I think the country as a whole is on the cusp of uh, potentially some very very bad developments. I think we could. I think we're. I think our the very the basis of our American democracy is at risk right now. Journalism is part of that. Uh, I'm not sure where we're going to come out. Uh, I. I I rule the day every day when I think of the world that we're leading, that I, that I and my generation are leaving to my grandchildren. It really, it really does worry me, and I'm not, and I'm not really sure all this new technology is a good thing. I think some of it, I think some of it, because I think some of it is way beyond our capacity to 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 rein in and to and to and to retain. 
So it's I, I'm not I'm not optimistic about it as you seem to be. I'm 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 uh, I'm, I'm worried sick. But Jack, yeah. we had the papers. We had lousy papers. Papers making stuff up. Uh, yellow journalism. Our oh, history in, in the history in 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 journalism that it's never been perfect. Is it's never been inclusive. It's, we're not, it's we're not, I don't, I don't, the, I don't, they say I don't, it's a free press to, in the newsroom. They can say, yeah, it's a free press for everybody that owns one. Uh, yeah, it, you couldn't right. own one, but now you can do these things. But uh, uh, one of the things, though, is we're blaming journalism for things that are coming out of the other pot. This, this thing that we're doing with the truth and 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 that's coming out of politics. This isn't coming out of journalism. Well, I, I, that's not true. You could say Murdoch introduced a lot of it at a certain level. But you know, I saw something on TV last night. Said I forget who said it, but said they want to challenge the license of somebody on TV. Was that NBC or what? But what I'm saying is, why was Murdoch allowed to come to the United States and bring this crazy? journalism that he brought with Fox News. Well, it's not just Murdoch, but anyway, let's let's hear what uh, Lee has to say. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to say anything. Well, I, I mean, I, uh, I I always start by saying I'm not a journalist. I was mm. a lawyer who represented journalists. <laughs> but um, I will say that um, in working on, on my book, um, uh, one of the things that struck me was something that Earl said just a minute ago, which is that so much of what we think of now as um, bad, unprecedented stuff uh, in terms of both bad journalism and bad government actors and misinformation um, in some ways was was worse um, during the time that Earl was reporting, um, you know, the kinds of things that the FBI was doing to, you know, covertly influence public opinion. Um, but by the same token, I have to say, I agree with Jack that something about today strikes me as, uh, although there are historical predicates, um, something about the combination of new technology uh, and the Trump phenomenon um, are a toxic mix, mix like we've never seen before. And, and I too worry uh, for democracy and, and uh, for, for, for a free press too. All right, here, here. Okay, that's gonna do it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank <laughs> you. And, Richard, uh, Richard I, have, I have one quick question. Is, yes. is this, um, is this going to be what some version of this is going to be uh, our portion of the program on Sunday? Yes. So I'm going to send out later on the run of the show and uh, this, this will be the 15 minute portion. And I think what we'll do is show excerpts of this during that 15 minutes and then make the whole thing available also so that anybody who wants to, to watch the whole thing can do so. You mean so do you still do you still want me or need me on Sunday? Sure. Okay. I mean, we're gonna. It's a, there's also the discussion after this. Okay. You know, a free for all. People to talk about, and and there's also other parts of the program, uh, which certainly concern media law. Uh, okay. You know, so uh, you know it, it concerns specifically the uh, journalists who have been arrested during protests and, and all that kind of thing. So, uh, yes. In this whole new thing we're looking at, how yes. do you define journalism? Who who are the journalists? That's 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 that was really one of my one of the points that I was trying to make is that you know if someone says that they work for the New York Times, then you assume that there's certain standards, there's certain processes and whatever that they go through in order to produce the product that they're putting on online or in the paper. If somebody somebody who works for, I don't know, brand X, you don't know what standards they're for. You don't know what they're doing. Anybody can call themselves a journalist in this country. Anybody can. 
And that's one of the reasons that I'm so we're so fearful about it because you just don't know. I mean, the, there are Fox News. I have a number of um, former co-workers at the time in the Washington Post and went to work for Fox News there. I consider them to be real journalists. They're people who follow the kind of procedures that I learned that you use, you know, to make sure that you're being accurate, to make sure you're being fair and all the rest of it. But they're in a they're in an environment where the 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 where the overall mission is to push a certain political point of view and where their story gets swamped. You saw what happened. A lot of them got fired after after reporting accurately uh in the last election that uh that um, Trump had lost to Arizona. You saw what happened there. Mm -hmm. So I, it worries me. I don't know who a journalist is anymore, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that's one of the reasons I'm so concerned. Consider the source. That's always been uh, uh, a good maxim to follow. All right. Thank you all so much. I'll see you on Sunday, and uh, enjoy the rest right. of the day. I, I, right. I would just like to yeah. say, oh, yeah, Jack, are you still going to be there in person? No, i i if I'm still. I'm still, as I said earlier, I'm still getting over this COVID. Yes. It really depends on, on depends on how I am on 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 Saturday. If I'm if I'm okay, I'll I'll come up. If I'm okay. still, all right. Well, if you do come up, you have to supply in advance, and that's by by today yeah. or tomorrow. I probably, I, I, I'm thinking it's it's not likely because I'm still. I think okay. I'm still. All right. Okay. Yeah. But they want they want people to submit their vaccination proof. Did you say get over the cold or COVID? No, he said COVID. 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 Mm. Yeah. The, 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 the big C. Wow. Uh, well, we'll talk. Give me a buzz. Uh, Richard, thanks so much. I appreciate the invitation. All right. Thank, thank you. I say is... that uh, you look very good with that mustache. I'm on. <laughs> well, I'm. <laughs> And and you and Jack with your beards, you know. <laughs> what can I say? All right. See you all on Monday then. All right. Great to see you guys. I'm sorry that I uh, uh, was so disjointed, but you know, this is the first time that I've met this talk and these things in many a moon. But welcome. It's nice to be back. All right.